Everybody, welcome to the session of application. Our first stop today will be Can you hear me? No. There we go. Now better? Ah, yes. All right, so welcome everybody to the session on obfuscation. Our first talk today will be titled The Pseudorandom Oracle Model and Ideal Obfuscation. This is work by Ayush Jain, Rachel Lin, G Luo, and Daniel Wicks, and G will give the talk. Um, thanks for the introduction. So, oops, oh, it's not working. So uh, obfuscation is the art of uh, making program code unintelligible while preserving its functionality. And in this talk, we'll be focusing on circuit obfuscation. By now, the standard security notion is indistinguishability obfuscation. Given two circuits of the same size and the same functionality, their obfuscations should be indistinguishable. IO is a really powerful primitive um, combined with mild assumptions, often just the existence of one-way functions, it implies almost all cryptography known prior to I.O., as well as many that were previously unknown. A long line of research also tells us that uh, I.O. can be constructed from well-studied assumptions. So what else is left to desire for obfuscation? At first sight, I.O. is actually a weak and unintuitive security notion. It was defined in 2001, and its first applications only appeared in 2013. That's more than a decade. When used naturally, it's unclear what security I.O. provides, and um, consequently, in applications, I.O. often has to be complemented with convoluted techniques. What do I mean by natural applications? One of the earliest examples is um, converting secret key encryption into a public key encryption by obfuscating its encryption algorithm. Many crypto applications, including this one, can be done using I.O. plus um, techniques such as puncturing. Perhaps the more interesting case is when you obfuscate a non-cryptographic program, such as software patches, anti-piracy checks, or machine learning models. Suppose I have trained a machine learning model. Studies have shown that the training data, which are often sensitive information, can be extracted by reading the model parameters. Now, suppose the model um, does not leak the training data from its input-output behavior. Can I obfuscate the model so that the obfuscated version also hides the training data? It's unclear whether IO achieves uh, the security. So let's get back to the security definitions. And actually, the first security de definition was not indistinguishability-based, but simulation-based. It says that given the obfuscated circuit, whatever an adversary can do can be simulated given only black box access to the program. The exact formalism vary. In ideal obfuscation, uh, we want the, the obfuscated program to be simulated given only black box access to the program. And in VBB obfuscation, the simulator is adversary dependent and the adversary only outputs one bit. Um, sadly, neither notion is achievable in general. Um, ideal obfuscation is blatantly impossible for unlearnable circuits such as pseudorandom functions, and there are contrived programs uh, that cannot be VBB obfuscated. But despite the impossibility results, we still like simulation security because it provides strong and intu intuitive security guarantees, and we can use uh, simple and intuitive designs in applications. Furthermore, sometimes they are the only uh, pathway to certain possible applications. There's a long list of them, um, some of them crypto, and also the general uh, goal of protecting non-cryptographic programs. So let me summarize the current state of the art of um, obfuscation. In the domain of programs, there's a small portion for which we know VBB obfuscation is impossible. There's also a small portion such as point functions that we know we can VBB obfuscate. But the rest, the vast majority of programs remains a mystery to us. We don't know whether they can VBB obfuscated or not. If you look at the domain of applications, 
crypto applications are only a tiny fraction of them. And for some applications, mostly crypto, we can solve the this, this situation using IO, but the rest, more natural applications, and including some of the crypto applications, still seems to require ideal obfuscation. Personally, I hold an optimistic worldview and argue for the natural heuristics. For natural programs, ideal obfuscation is possible, and for natural applications of ideal obfuscation, we think they're plausible. Can we justify them? This is the motivation of our work. Actually, something very similar also happens for hash functions. A hash function takes as input an arbitrarily long string and outputs a fixed length digest. We can define many security properties as complexity assumptions, and they're quite useful. However, some very intuitive usages of hash functions evade all attempts of reduction proofs um, to simple to state complexity assumptions. So going beyond complexity assumptions, we turn to idealized models. The random oracle model is a well-established model for hash functions. It models the hash function as a public random function that everyone has Oracle access to. It has been used in the design and analysis of practically used and more efficient schemes. And although the ROM suffers from um, uninstantiability results, those are contrived. And a proof in the ROM is still better than no proof at all. Lastly, the ideas in the ROM also served as um, precursors to standard model versions. For example, correlation intractability has been used to instantiate uh, the fiat Shamir paradigm, which was first proven secure in the ROM. So um, random oracle is an idealization of hash functions, and we can regard ideal obfuscation as an idealization of indistinguishability obfuscation. It's also easy to obtain random oracle from ideal obfuscation by obfuscating a pseudorandom function. So we naturally ask, uh, what about the other direction? Unfortunately, it's been proven that uh, VBB obfuscation does not exist in the random oracle model. So black box use of hash functions does not help building ideal obfuscation. Well, what about no black box use? And our answer is, um, yes, it does help. We propose a new idealized model for hash functions uh, called the pseudo-random oracle model. It's similar to the ROM, but it provides more flexibility. We prove that assuming functional encryption for circuits, we can construct ideal obfuscation uh, in the pseudo-random oracle model. So our theorem justifies all the downstream applications of ideal obfuscation and Another interesting bit is that we only rely on polynomial security of functional encryption as opposed to sub-exponential security required in uh, all known standard model proofs. So it raises the hope of getting IO from just polynomial security. And our result can be interpreted in multiple ways, but in this talk, I'd like to focus on the heuristics part. We can regard um, this construction as a reduction of heuristics. If we believe that hash functions can be idealized, and in particular, idealized as the pseudo-random oracle, then we should believe that obfuscation can also be idealized because the latter can be constructed from or reduced to the former. And in other words, uh, our work delivers the message that ideal obfuscation is not a crazier heuristic than ideal hash functions. Okay, so much for the philosophical rant, and let's get technical and define the pseudorandom uh, the pseudorandom oracle model, or pro model, or as I call it, the PROM. So remember, this model has to capture two aspects of the hash function: that it looks like a random function, and that it has short code. And this object is too familiar to us. It's a pseudorandom function. So the PROM is parameterized by a pseudorandom function. And anyone, such as the user, can come up with a PRF key and request its handle. The Oracle will map the, hand, uh, the, the, the PRF key to a handle and send it back to the user. Then the handle can be distributed to other entities, such as the adversary. And with the handle, the adversary can request evaluation at any point. Uh, the Oracle will recover the PRF key under this handle and then return the PRF evaluation result. So if we forget about the PRF key and just look at the lower half, uh, this is indistinguishable to the random oracle model. 
So the power of PRON lies in that it allows us to model two kinds of access to the hash function simultaneously. But then uh, here, here's an immediate problem. Suppose I use both the key and the handle. Since the key is present, um, the Oracle response is not random because it's correlated with the key. So um, I think this can be best explained uh, by the following basic recipe of using PROM. So in, in a scheme using PROM, the user will create a PRF key uh, and its handle, and then we'll encrypt the PRF key under some primitives such as homomorphic encryption, garbled circuits, or functional encryption, which allows some form of computation over the key. Then with the, this information, the adversary can use the primitive to perform computation and use the handle to request the evaluation from the Oracle. Now, at this stage, we cannot monitor or program the Oracle because um, the adversary knows the key, at least information theoretically. But we don't really expect the adversary to do arbitrary things to the key. That's why we protect it. So we can invoke the security of the primitive to enter a hybrid where um, the key, the, the, the part about the key is simulated using various evaluations of this PRF. And since the key is no longer directly used, we can invoke the PRF security and uh, convert this function into a random function. And in this hybrid, we can monitor and program on the Oracle because it's a random Oracle now. And from this basic recipe, you can also see that we can only use the code in some limited ways. In other words, it must be indistinguishable to a hybrid where there's only black box use. And how do we instantiate Piron? Uh, we think that any hash function good for the random Oracle is suitable for Piron when sorted. For example, we can let the handle and the key both be the same random string and define the function to be SHA of k concatenated with the input. And it might be weird, why can we set um, the handle to be the same thing as the key? Um, doesn't that give the adversary, for example, uh, non black box access to the hash function? Um, I would argue that it's not weird because uh, we already do that in the ROM because in the ROM, uh, we just pretend that we don't use the code of the hash function, even though uh, when instantiated, we still replace any Oracle call to the, um, to the code of the hash function. And also, uh, what can you do given a prefix? The only meaningful thing you can do is to evaluate the hash function at its extensions, which is the same as the situation in ROM, so it's fine. Okay, in the rest of the talk, I'll show you the uh, most interesting ideas in our construction of ideal obfuscation. Since ideal obfuscation is not possible in the standard model, we define it uh, with respect to an Oracle model or idealized model. So here the input circuit is a normal circuit that doesn't have Oracle access, but the obfuscation program as well as the obfuscated version of the circuit um, have access to the uh, Oracle. And for security, we'll consider the real world and the simulation. In the real world, the adversary first interacts with this idealized model, and then it chooses a circuit, we obfuscate it, and return it to the adversary. And then the adversary can, again, um, interact with the idealized model. In the simulation, everything is handled by the simulator. It handles the pre-obfuscation uh, interaction with the idealized model, and when the adversary chooses the circuit to be obfuscated, we create a black box of the circuit and give the circuit size and its input size to the simulator. From this point, the simulator can interact with the black box of the circuit and use it to produce the simulated version of the uh, obfuscation. Also, it has to handle the post uh, obfuscation queries uh, for which it can also interact with the circuit in black box in order to produce the response. And the requirement is, of course, the real world is indistinguishable to the simulated world. To construct the ideal obfuscation, we need a standard model to uh, functional encryption. So for functional encryption, you have a data owner who sets up the system, generating the master key pair. Using the master secret key, you can generate a functional key for any function. And using the master public key, you can encrypt any input to this function. And then decryption will yield the function evaluation, uh, evaluation result, but nothing more. 
Uh, there are some efficiency requirements for the functional encryption. It has to be sublinear. Um, the encryption algorithm has to run in time sublinear in the function size and subtractic in the input size. And then for security, we require the standard indistinguishability-based security. So ciphertext for two possible inputs are indistinguishable given a public key and a functional key if the function evaluation results are the same. And uh, um, turns out such an FE follows from the so-called obfuscation minimum FE, which are those that suffices for the existing transformations to IO in the literature, and they can be based on uh, well-studied assumptions. Okay, so um, our starting point of uh, obfuscator is the classic uh, FE to IO transformation in the standard model. So in these constructions, uh, we should think that there's a perfect binary tree where each leaf is associated with a possible input. And each internal node is associated with its root to node path, which is a prefix of the input. And we also put a functional encryption ciphertext encrypting the circuit, the prefix, and some other things to this node. And uh, to evaluate the um, obfuscated circuit, we'll perform a traverse uh, over the tree. And the traversal is done using a functional encryption uh, secret key. So decrypting the root ciphertext will get its two child ciphertexts. And depending on the path, for example, one uh, we want to go, we'll discard the other ciphertext and continue this procedure. At any intermediate node, uh, for example, CTK, we'll do this um, decryption and get two um, child ciphertexts and then choose one until we reach the leaf ciphertext. Uh, at the leaf ciphertext, we perform one final decryption to uh, obtain the evaluation result. From this procedure, we can uh, see how the function should be set. Namely, the function should output two ciphertexts when given as input the circuit and the prefix. Uh, when the prefix is not the full length, or it should be the universal circuit um, evaluating the, uh, the encryption when uh, there's a full input. And here I can explain what these other informations are because um, in order to produce the ciphertext, we need to run the encryption algorithm. So this uh, dot, dot, dot will just be the PRF seed, uh, PRFP or PRG seed for generating those randomness. Okay, so the obfuscation, just two parts, the functional key and the root ciphertext. So now comes an adversary. The adversary can at least evaluate this obfuscated circuit at various inputs. And the problem is that we don't know where this adversary is evaluating. This creates two problems. One is that um, since we do not know where it's interested, we have to be prepared for all possible inputs. So we cannot, just hardware all the possible outputs into the very short obfuscation. Also in the proof, we also have to go through all the possible inputs um, to perform the, um, the indistinguishability reduction. And this creates an, an exponential loss. And also I want to mention that the idea that this adversary is, is exploring somewhere is just our imagination because it can do some crazy things to the of a skated circuit that doesn't correspond to any well-defined path. But uh, well, this is where the idealized models can help. And let me explain this in the ROM first. So suppose now the function doesn't give you the expanded ciphertext or the evaluation result directly, but it will one time have the result using an, uh, an output of the random oracle. Then uh, the evaluation will first give you a one-time padded version of the ciphertext. And then you have to query the random, uh, the random oracle to remove the one-time pad. Then you continue this procedure. At any intermediate stage, you will have to query the random oracle on chi to um, be able to make sense of the de decryption result. And then eventually you have to query uh, the random oracle on x for which you want to evaluate the circuit. And the invariant that we keep along this, uh, this design is that if you do not query some point in the random oracle, then the decryption result is hidden. And using this, uh, we can, in the simulation, observe where the adversary queries the oracle 
to, to learn its exploration path and then also program the random Merkle responses uh, in order to do the simulation. But here's the problem because uh, the functional encryption is a standard model thing. You cannot call the random Merkle inside the circuit for which you want to generate a key. And this is where uh, the PROM helps because it gives you the code of the, uh, of the Oracle. So now in the ciphertext, I will additionally encrypt a PRF key and the function will evaluate the PRF on the path chi. And in the obfuscation, I will also give out the handle for this key. Now there's no syntactical problem because uh, we can use the code of the PRF in the circuit for which we want to generate the, um, the functional encryption key. And then during decryption, we can uh, let the evaluator use the handle to perform this uh, evaluation of random oracle. And for simulation, uh, we'll just uh, keep this invariant of decryption and allow the ciphertext to be in another form which produces pseudo-random strings. So in the, in the simulation, every ciphertext will encrypt a PRG seed, and then the oracle response is programmed to be um, a clear text output X word with this pseudo random string. And you can see that this is fine because the, um, the simulated version of the obfuscated of circuit does not use the circuit directly. And then the circuit is only queried upon a corresponding query to the random oracle. Uh, some caution here is that this is very simplified. We need more tricks to make the proof go through in the uh, actual paper. And I would refer you to the to our full paper for the details. Okay, to summarize, we propose a new idealized model for hash functions that captures its code called the pseudo-random Oracle model. And we uh, construct ideal obfuscation in the pseudo-random Oracle model, assuming functional encryption. Um, an interesting question for future work is to find more applications of the PROM. And with that, I'll conclude my talk. Any questions? Hi, um, very, very nice talk. So um, with this PROM, do you think uh, you could maybe use the PROM in some way to uh, build better functional encryption schemes? Would that be okay in your construction to have this FE that actually uses the PROM? Um, good question. With I think we can already build simulation secure functional encryption in PROM, which uh, is quite direct from ideal obfuscation. Uh, but other kinds of improvements to functional encryption, I'm not sure yet. Thank you. So I have a question. So maybe I'm not sure. So are you saying that you can essentially use a PROM whenever you want to use an ideal application? So with any construction from ideal application now it just goes through in the PROM model, or is there work to be done? Like maybe if you assume functional encryption additionally. Uh I think any application of ideal obfuscation will be fine if you just uh, instantiate with a PROM. Okay. All right. I uh, thank you. Um so let's thank the speaker again.
right. Our next talk will be uh, called Computational Wiretap Coding from Indistinguishability Application. And this is work by Yuvali Shai, Ayush Jain, Paul Liu, Amit Sahai, and Mark Chandri. And uh, Paul will give the talk. Yeah, wonderful. All right. So this is Computational Wiretap Coding from Indistinguishability Obfuscation. This is joint work with Yuval, Ayush, Amit, and Mark. Um, I don't think the clicking was working. Ah, thank you. Okay, so we're gonna start with the teaser. And this teaser will be an interesting special case of the general wiretap problem. So here's the teaser. It's a curious coding theoretic question. Suppose I have a random linear code uh, and I'm encoding some uh, binary string X and I send it through some binary symmetric channel which flips every single bit with 10% probability. Then decoding from this code word is hard and it's computationally hard because of the learning parity with noise problem with constant error probability. Now, if I send the same code word through a binary erasure channel with 0.3 probability of erasure, then for the right choice of parameters, meaning like length of the random linear code or dimension of the random linear code, Gaussian elim elimination recovers X. So recovering from erasures is easy. And in general, in coding theory, uh, the problem of decoding from erasures is easier than decoding from flips. So let's turn this question on its head and ask the following question. Do there exist error correcting codes that satisf satisfy both of the following properties? One, it's easy to decode uh, from 0 0.1 bit flip error rates. So there are plenty of codes that satisfy this, such as LDPC codes, uh, BCH codes, and et cetera. And uh, we, we want the second property that it's computationally hard under some reasonable standard hardness assumptions to decode from a 30% erasure rate. And just observe by our example here, uh, linear codes fail. And until last year, no such codes were known to satisfy both properties. And in a work uh, with Ashai, Core, Blue, and Sahai in 2022 here at Crypto, uh, we answer this with yes in the ideal obfuscation model. And there's an asterisk on the yes because actually our encoding scheme is probabilistic, not deterministic, um, or using non-standard virtual black box obfuscation assumptions. And in this work, we uh, further advance this progress by saying yes with an the same asterisk, uh, assuming standard hardness assumptions. So let me introduce the general setting uh, of the wiretap channel introduced first by Weiner in 1975. And in this setting, you have Alice trying to send a message to Bob and Alice has a unidirectional channel, channel B, noisy channel to, channel, uh, to Bob and another channel to Eve. These channels are discrete memoryless channels. It's non-interactive, there's, no uh, there's no plain channel, there's no back and forth communication, there's no shared secrets, there's no shared keys. And we need to find an encoding scheme such that Bob can decode and Eve cannot. And that's a wiretap coding scheme. And the, quest the main question is a feasibility question. For what pairs of channels do wiretap coding schemes exist? And let me give you an intuitive and possibility result for a, a specific pair of channels. Consider the channel pair, a binary symmetric channel 0 0.1, so flips with probability uh, 0 0.1, and a binary erasure channel, which erases with probability 0.2. In this case, Eve can perfectly simulate Bob's channel's output distribution by simply randomly guessing a bit for every single erasure position. And in general, whenever Eve can simulate Bob's output, there's no asymmetry in the amount of information that Bob gets, so there's no possible encoding scheme. And so this is captured by the notion of degradation. So we say that channel B is a ch degradation of channel E, if and only if Eve can perfectly simulate channel B using channel E. And one can ask, do there exist uh, wiretap coding schemes for non-degraded channel pairs in, which, in the case where Eve cannot simulate Bob? And surprisingly in 1978, uh, Cesar and Corner show that there are non-degraded channel pairs that do not have statistical wiretap coding schemes. Statistical, here I mean information theoretic. 
So an example of this is our favorite example, the binary symmetric channel with 10% flip probability and the binary erasure channel with 0.3 erasure probability. So then we can ask, can we do better in the computational setting? Uh, and can we do this using cryptography? And our work last year showed that indeed we can. Uh, in fact, whenever the, the, the channel pair is non-degraded, there exists a computational wiretap coding scheme in the ideal obfuscation model or using non-standard VVB obfuscation. And so our running example of a BSC 0.1, BC 0.3 now uh, has a computational wiretap coding scheme. And now we ask the foundational question, can we obtain computational wiretap coding schemes from standard assumptions? And our main result makes progress on this by answering this in the affirmative theorem. The main theorem is assuming the existence of IO and injective PRGs, there exists computational wiretap coding schemes for any pair of non-degraded binary input channels. Uh, so this is a large class of standard channels. Um, and this solves the teaser. And here again, same asterisk as before. Uh, our encoding scheme is probabilistic, not deterministic. But this, uh, we, we have uh, wiretap coding now from standard assumptions for a large class of natural channel pairs. OK, summary of our techniques. Uh, we first use IO and injective PRGs to construct a Hamming ball obfuscator. And this construction uses a new gadget, which we call a PRG with self-correction. And using this, we will build computational wiretap coding schemes for a particular class of um, uh, channel pairs, this asymmetric setting, where Bob's channel is a binary asymmetric channel, and Eve's channel is a binary asymmetric erasure channel. Um, and I will uh, give you the definitions later for those for everything there. And then the second thing we use to reduce to this case is we introduce a new polytope characterization of degradation. And using this polytope characterization, we can reduce the problem of constructing a computational wiretap coding for the general uh, binary uh, channel pair, uh, non-degraded binary input channel pair case to one for this specific class of channel pairs. And the focus of this talk, in, in, um, in, interest of, in the interest of time, is um, a computational wiretap coding scheme for IO for the symmetric case, where Bob's channel is a binary symmetric channel with 0 0.1 uh, flip probability, and Eve's channel is a binary erasure channel with 0 0.3 flip probability. Um, and the construction that we're going to show you here easily extends to the non-degraded uh, BAC, BAEC setting. And uh, see this paper or the slide appendix online for extension to uh, non-degraded binary, all non-degraded binary input channel pairs. OK, let me give you a quick uh, refresher on what IO is. Uh, IO is where if you uh, take a circuit C0, if you IO it, it will produce some obfuscated circuit C0 hat with exactly the same input output behavior. And if I have two circuits C0, C1, of the same size and same functionality input output behavior, then their two IOs are computationally indistinguishable. So it's a pseudo canonicalizer. And we now know this from st standard hardness assumptions from the work of Jane Lynn and Sahai in 2021. And this is a new gadget we introduced in this talk, which will be a PRG with self correction. And what is a PRG with self correction? It satisfies two properties. The first one is the standard PRG definition. We have polynomial stretch, uh, and we have pseudo-randomness. And just note that this polynomial stretch may depend on this epsilon for the epsilon self-correction. Um, and epsilon self-correction is this new property. And what does it say? It says that it, given uh, the, PRG on, uh, the PRG output on some seed and some seed prime that is correlated or has a, at least half plus epsilon agreement with the original PRG seed, you can actually efficiently recover the PRG seed. Um, and for this talk, you can just think of epsilon as being 1 over 12. Uh, but in general, it's some constant. And uh, uh, Bogdanov and Chow in 2012 showed that the Goldreich PRG, even with linear stretch, 
is a self-correcting PRG. So we do know these things exist. And in our work, we show how to construct an injective SCPRG from any injective PRG. So let me review the construction idea for a wiretap coding scheme from last year's work, where we assumed ideal obfuscation. So again, Bob's, is, Bob's channel is BSC 0.1, Eve's channel is BEC 0.3. What is the encoding scheme? The encoding scheme consists of a uniformly random chosen uh, string R and a obfuscation of this following Hamming ball function or Hamming ball circuit. And this Hamming ball circuit has hard coded in it this randomly chosen string, uh, this randomly chosen string R. And what does the Hamming ball function do? It just checks if its input is approximately 10% uh, has 10% flips relative to this hard coded R. If so, output the payload, the message M. And if not, just output bot. And just observe that, uh, and then what we're going to do is we're going to send the random string R through both channels. And then we're going to send the obfuscation of this circuit through both channels encoded to Bob's channel. So Bob will be able to decode and just assume that Eve can decode, um, just give Eve more power. And we just observe by a churn-off bound that with, high, with overwhelming probability, by just feeding Bob's received string into this obfuscated function, Bob will recover the message M. And Eve's best guess, uh, so Eve will receive some string with about 30% erasures. So her best guess will be to flip a random bit for every erasure position. And that will result in a 0 0.15 error rate. And so from Eve's point of view, this obfuscated function behaves no, uh, just like the null function. It'll just output bot all the time. And if we were using an ideal obfuscation, both the payload and this hard-coded R are completely hidden. So that gives security in the ideal obfuscation model. Now we're going to move to the IO setting. And the question we should be asking ourselves is, why would IO of F sub R, this Hamming ball function, hide anything? After all, uh, what is our goal? Our goal is to use some hybrid argument to show that the circuit is indistinguishable from the null circuit. And the problem is that this Hamming ball circuit actually differs in potentially exponentially many points. So there's no way that IO will work. I only works on functions that have identical uh, um, input output behavior. So uh, actually, let me go back real quick. So what does Eve see? Eve sees some. Uh, uh, erased version of this string R and this IO function, Hamming ball function. And our critical observation to make IO work is that in intermediate hybrids, the circuit can actually depend on this received string R sub E. And what we're going to do is we're going to consider the indices where there is an erasure. So S sub bot is the set of indices where there's an erasure. And S sub zero one is the, uh, the complement. And what we're going to do is we're going to consider the following hybrid, where the circuit now just uh, splits the hard coded R into two substrings dependent on this S bot. And just for convenience of notation, as a, as a reminder, a guideline for, for the audience, R prime is Eve's guess. Um, and what we're going to do is we're also going to split this Hamming distance metric. So instead of just computing the Hamming distance on the whole string, compute it in two halves. So, so far we've done nothing but syntactical changes. This is just notational changes. Um, and R prime S bot, R prime S sub zero one are substrings of Eve's guess corresponding to the erasure positions. Uh, R without the prime is the original string, uh, substrings of the original string. And just observe that we've done nothing but split uh, everything syntactically. So this is functionally equivalent to the original circuit F. But let's make some observations on this circuit, this new circuit. Um, Eve knows the non-erased coordinates. That's by definition. And Eve's best strategy for this S bot indices is to uniformly guess. And there are exponentially many guesses that cause the function to output M. So this is not good if we want to switch to the null circuit. And we need some way of compressing this into a single branch that can be removed 
by hybrid argument. And this is where the SCPRG comes into play. What we're going to do is we're going to remove the hard coding of uh, certain positions, RS bot. And we're going to replace this with an SCPRG with uh, epsilon being 1 12th on RS bot. And this parameter epsilon is dependent on the degradation condition, is set such that Eve is unable to recover um, uh, from uh, recover the, the original seed. And just observe that from Eve's point of view, um, sorry, there's, there's a dash, but just ignore that. Uh, from Eve's point of view, RS bot is an unknown uniform random string. So the PRG input is uniform random from Eve's point of view. And therefore, we can apply the pseudo randomness property. I guess I should go over uh, the circuit real quick. What does the circuit do? Um, the circuit will just attempt to recover the seed. And uh, it's going to, uh, if it recovers the seed, it can check by just checking uh, relative to this hard coded PRG output. And if it doesn't recover the correct uh, PRG output, the function outputs bot. But if it does recover uh, the correct PRG uh, seed, then just proceed by the original functionality. Okay. So now we're going to apply the pseudo randomness property. We're going to switch this PRG output to a uniform random string R. And with overwhelming probability R for a length tripling SCPRG, uh, R will not be in the range of this SCPRG. So this will be functionally equivalent to the null circuit. And that's that's it. And let me quickly describe how to uh, construct the SCPRG. You're going to take any injective PRG G and any list decodable uh, error correcting code C. So what does list decodable mean? It means that um, uh, if you give me something within half minus epsilon error rate of the uh, of, of of the code word, uh, the recover algorithm will output a polynomial size list guaranteed to contain the original uh, plain text. And for this specific list decodable error correcting code for half minus epsilon error rate, this binary uh, list decodable error correcting code, we're going to think of it as a connect, uh, concatenated code of a uh, binary Reed Solomon code with a Hadamard code. And this is known from Sedan, Trevisan, Vadan in 1999 and Sedan in 2000. So what is the SCPRG construction? It's just going to be the following. We're going to split the seed into two parts, uh, S1 and S2. And what you're going to do is you're going to output S1 off, uh, offsetting this code word of S2 and the PRG of S2. And why is it pseudo random? Well, S1 is uniform random. So S1 plus C of S2 is uniform random. And then you can just apply the PRG property on G of S2. So that gives pseudo randomness. And why, why does self-correction work? Well, if the original seed is close to, uh, to, this, uh, to a guest seed prime, so S1 prime, S2 prime, then for appropriate lengths of S1 and S2, you can show that just the first portion will be close. And if the first portion is close, then you can get a polynomial size list containing S2 uh, from S1 plus CS2 by running the list decodable uh, recovery algorithm. And once you have S2, you can, uh, you can check using GFS2, this injectivity property, that you got the right S2. And then you can uh, strip off CFS2 and recover S1. So that's the code offset construction. And as a recap, uh, we sketched the construction security proof for a computational wiretap coding scheme for the non-degraded BSCBC case via IO and injective PRGs. Um, and then this construction easily extends to the BAC BAEC setting. Uh, and this is what a BAC BAEC is. It's where the flip probabilities for 0 and 1 may differ. And the erasure probabilities for 0 and 1 may differ. So E0 may not be equal to E1, and P1 may not be equal to P0. Um, and it easily extends by just changing which uh, the, the, the Hamming ball radius and changing the initial input distribution for how you pick the random string R. And then finally, to reduce any arbitrary binary input channel pair, non-degraded binary input channel pair to the first case, um, we use the polytope characterization. So basically, uh, 
um, you, this is information theoretic uh, modeling uh, or characterization of degradation. So you can model every, every channel as a polytope. So here, for example, the blue polytope is a binary symmetric channel. This red polytope is an arbitrary Eve uh, polytope. That is a channel that is not a degradation uh, such that this, uh, this, blue poly, this blue channel is not a degradation of the red channel. And uh, you can basically reduce the BAEC setting by a simple application of the separating hyperplane theorem in this setting. So uh, some open directions. So we would like to expand our construction beyond binary input channels. There's really two ways to go about this. One is to have a direct construction, or the other uh, way is to try to make our proof uh, go through. And that would require characterizing degradation for uh, dimension three and beyond. Um, some other open questions. Uh, can we realize computational wiretap coding from standard hardness assumptions or from simpler cryptographic primitives, not obfuscation? And then uh, addressing the asterisk in the initial teaser or riddle. And can we de-randomize the encoding? Because we say we have a solution for this, this coding theoretic question, but the, uh, the encoder is probabilistic. So that's it. Thank you. Any questions? Hey, um, really enjoy your talk. So I, I guess I have two questions, just sort of clarification. So first, um, what can you give one application in practice where wild wiretap coding channels is like a natural um, modeling and in like real life. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this would be related to physical layer security. So suppose for example, that like, uh, you have, instead of using NFC for contactless payments, you, mm -hmm. you want keyless payments where your phone is like right next to the, the payment register. If you're like a centimeter away from, from the payment register, then you're guaranteed that there's too much noise for, for the payment to go, uh, to, for, for the credit card. To, uh, to actually go through. So that's an example. So, uh, but otherwise wiretap coding, yeah, I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's, that's very yeah. cool. Um, another thing is what, what breaks when you try to go to non-binary input channels? Great, so, and uh, actually in degradation, the degradation, we can find a pair of channels mm -hmm. for which the degradation condition, the if and only if relation between a polytope containment and the degradation condition doesn't go through. So our proof technique doesn't go through um, uh, because the, the polytope characterization is actually not uh, identical to, to channel degradation. I so see. that's what breaks down uh, in the cases of three and above. And I mentioned three and above, we actually have an explicit counterexample of when this happens. Cool, thanks. Yeah. All right. um, any more questions? Okay, in that case, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. And that concludes our session. So I think we have a track switch and then the invited talkers next.